Would you pray with me? God, you are great, you are glorious, you are awesome in your power, and we come to you humbly in reverence, knowing that you are uh, the king on your throne, and also knowing that you are uh, a kind and gracious redeemer. So we thank you that we can come into your presence because of the blood of Christ. We thank you that you hear our prayers, that you hear our worship, that you hear our songs, and we thank you that you have spoken that you have given us your word, that you have told us how to live, that you have revealed your will to us. So I pray that this morning we would have humble, teachable hearts as we hear from your word, that you would grow us in our, our love for Christ and our love for the Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It is good to be with you again this morning. My name is uh, Kyle Frazee. I lead the uh, student ministries here at the church and have an opportunity uh, this week and next week to just finish a series that I started last week on the Christian home, just taking a quick detour from the book of Revelation to talk about just God's plan for the home in Ephesians 5. So you can turn in your Bible to Ephesians 5. Uh, last week we looked at the wives, Ephesians 5:22. This week we're going to look at the, the husbands, Ephesians 5:25 and following. And then uh, next week uh, we will look at Ephesians 6, verse 1 through 4, the uh, children and the parents. So we're going to focus again on this all-important topic, the Christian home. And this morning, we're going to go after the men, go after the husbands, go after the leaders in the home. And before I, I dive into that, I just want to, to zoom out a little bit and just talk about the importance of what we do in here, what, what the importance is of the church, uh, what, what God does through the church, this unique entity that Jesus has commissioned to take his gospel to the nations. Uh, First Timothy, Paul says that the church is the pillar and support of the truth. In a world full of lies, where can you go for answers to life's problems? Where can you go for solutions? Well, the church, because we have the truth. There was a, a woman who called into the church last week looking for a, a pastor to help uh, officiate a memorial service for a family member, just a, a tragic death that she'd experienced. Uh, not a member of this church, just someone in the community but she came to the church because she knew that you, you have answers. You have hope there. You have the truth there. This is what, what we have, the privilege that we have. We have God's truth. We have God's word. We have the, the gospel message. In the church, the pillar and support of the truth is only as strong as the, the, the health of the church. Only healthy churches declare the truth with authority. Because if you step into an unhealthy church and they declare a message of salvation and you look at their lives and their lives have not been changed by that gospel, you would say, well, that's not a true message. But, but a healthy church, a vibrant church, a church that's been transformed by the gospel, when they preach that message and people look inside the church, what they see are people who believe that message, whose lives have been transformed by that message. So the, the health of the church is part of what God uses to uphold his truth in the world. So what we do here matters. In a healthy church, the, the spiritual vibrancy of the church is dependent on the health, the spiritual health of the men of the church. We, we will not be able to take this gospel message to the nations. We will not be able to take this gospel message to Tempe, Arizona, to our neighborhood, if we don't have faithful, godly men we will not be able to uphold God's truth in the world without a generation of faithful men who, who love the truth, who have been transformed by the truth. So we need men. We need mature men. We need biblically-minded men. We, we live in a world of full of selfish men, men who are about their own comfort, who go after entertainment, entertainment and ease and convenience, who don't make hard decisions, don't want to make hard choices, who don't want to take responsibility for their actions. And what the church needs and what the home needs are godly, faithful men. So we're going to see a, a biblical picture this morning of masculinity. This is biblical masculinity on the pages of our Bible. This is what a, a godly man looks like. And we're going to see this in Ephesians 5. And a godly man pictured here in this critical area of importance in his home, in this apex relationship, how he treats his wife in the home. 
This is biblical manhood right here, sacrificial love in the home. So let's read together uh, Ephesians 5. We're going to be looking at verses 25 through 33. And we're going to see this picture of sacrificial love, biblical manhood. Ephesians 5, 25. Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you is also to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. I was uh, driving with my kids the other day, and we saw a license plate that had a scripture reference on the back. And usually when I see that, I'm encouraged. Oh, this is great. Uh, maybe a Christian. They, they love the Lord. And the reference was Genesis 27, verse 3. Genesis 27, 3. And I'm trying to figure out with my kids, what, what reference is this? I'm thinking Genesis 15. Abraham believed God and his credit to him as righteousness. But I'm like, all right, what's in Genesis 27? This is Isaac, Jacob. So we look up the reference. And here, here's what, the, the back of this truck, the reference in Genesis 27, 3 says, now then, please take your gear, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Isaac's instruction to Esau, right? So this is, you know, what our culture would define on a pickup truck. This is biblical manhood. <laughs> biblical manhood, right? To have a pickup truck, to go hunting. And there's you know, something biblical about providing for your family, so I don't want to minimize that. But, but our culture would have, uh, would have us believe on the conservative side, that biblical manhood is, you know, having a truck, going hunting, you know, wearing a t-shirt that says, don't tread on me. And, and on the other side, you have the egalitarian mindset, that there's no distinction. There's no such thing as man and woman. Men, men shouldn't even lead. They shouldn't even try to lead. And we're left in the middle to, to find a biblical picture of what is manhood? What does God say manhood looks like? And you see here in Ephesians 5.25, here is biblical manhood. Husbands, love your wives. This is the, the description here of manhood, is sacrificial love. A picture of manhood. A love is being consumed with the needs of others at great personal cost, without thought of personal gain, regardless of the merit, merit of the recipient. And here Paul, in, in verse 23, has just said that the husband is the head of the wife. He is the leader. He has the authority and the responsibility in the garden, when Adam calls out to the man after they have sinned, he says, where are you, Adam? Where is the man? He is responsible. The man is responsible to, to make the decisions for his family, to lead his family, to lead in the, the spiritual climate of his home, to lead in the priorities of his home, to lead the, the direction of the home. And usually when, when you come up to give a sermon, I, one of my goals in giving a sermon is I want, to, I want to lighten your load. I want to give you hope. Well, well, this morning, for some of the men here, I want to actually put, a, put an extra burden on your back. If you don't feel the, the burden of leadership, to actually feel the weight. I, I read one uh, pastor talked about mature leadership. And he talked about mature leadership in this way. He said it's to, to sense the weight of responsibility, a growing sense, a growing burden, to actually feel the weight of it. To say, I, I, before God, I actually sense this. I wake up in the morning burdened that I have to provide for my family, that I have to, to set a trajectory. I stay up late because of this weight that I carry for leading my family. I have my Bible open, wrestling for wisdom in decision-making. You know, when you hear a, a sound at night, to feel the burden that I, I have to step in. I have to figure out what's going on outside. So you must feel this burden. An immature man, an immature husband doesn't feel the, the weight of that responsibility, doesn't feel the burden of leadership. I was talking to a, a young man recently who was uh, engaged 
about to be married, and, and he was just talking about going to work now that he's engaged. It feels a little bit heavier. It feels a little weightier, he said, because now I got to think about paying rent, and I got to think about providing for a wife soon. And he said, man, I, I feel that weight when I go to work in the morning. And like, that's a, that's a great thing. I'm so excited to hear that you're feeling that responsibility. You should. This is good. This is the, the burden of leadership. In God's eyes, the husband, he is the leader. That is a, a fact, whether you have embraced it or not, whether our culture would embrace it or not, whether your wife has embraced it or not. In God's eyes, he says the man is the head. He is the leader. He has the responsibility. He is uh, accountable before God for decisions. So now the, the question here to, to ask ourselves is, how are you doing with that leadership? Men, husbands, how are you wielding that responsibility and authority? And this is where this passage takes us, uh, really a, a test of your leadership, to ask, how am I doing in my leadership in the home? Well, the question to ask yourself, the test, well, how am I doing at loving in my home? How is my love in my home toward my wife? Your, your leadership will not rise above the sacrificial love that you display in the home. So we're going to look at this morning uh, two characteristics uh, of a husband's loving leadership. Last week we looked at a, a wife's humble submission. This week, the, the husband who is the leader, how does he lead in love? What, is it, what does it look like to be a loving leader? Joel James writes of a, a husband's leadership. He says, a husband's love is a choice making this love stronger and more enduring than mere infatuation. It embraces feelings, but is not dependent on them. And I love how he says that. It embraces feelings, not, not apart from affection, but not dependent on affection, not dependent on how I'm feeling today. It is a commitment of the will. Love is a, a commitment when you're, when you're not feeling like serving. When the, the warm fuzzies, you don't feel like you're in love anymore. A commitment to, to this person who, whom God has given you. And, and if you're not married, if you're not a husband in this room, you can still benefit greatly from this passage. To look at the, the principles in this passage, this is not just a passage for husbands or not just a passage for wives. This is a passage for the church. And this tells us what sacrificial love looks like. All of us are called to love one another. All of us are called to love as Christ loves. And we get a picture here of this apex relationship, a marriage relationship, a picture of Christ's love for his church. But all of us should look at love this way. How do I sacrificially die to myself to, to care for others? That's what we see in this passage. It is a model of love. And the, the primary implication here for marriage, for husbands. In this passage, Paul, just big picture, gives us two illustrations Two illustrations for love. The, the first illustration is going to be Christ's love for his church. This is how Christ loved the church. This is what he did. And then the second illustration that Paul gives is a man's natural care for his own body. It's a really practical passage. Let me, let me give you a picture for those of you that are visual learners, like picture books. Paul is saying, I want to give you illustrations here. This is what love looks like. Christ's love is a model and the way that you naturally care for yourself. You already know how you do that. You already know what it looks like to, to get up early and, and take care of your own needs. So now, now you actually need to bring the other person into this. Bring your wife into what you naturally do for yourself. So first, the, the love that Christ has for his church. Uh, first characteristic here is this uh, a self-giving love. It is a uh, husband's loving leadership is self-giving. You could say sacrificial or, or self-denying. That's what love does. It gives of itself. Just a, a raw definition of love. A giving of oneself to another. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his son. Jesus here in, in verse, five, uh, verse 25. That Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is what Christ does. Fueled by his love for his people, for his bride. He gave himself. And here gave himself up. His own volition is the idea here. He willingly went to the cross, willingly laid down his, Christ, his, his life. Uh, John 10, 18, Jesus said, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. He gave up himself. It wasn't Pilate that held him on the cross or the Roman soldiers 
or the, the wood or the nails that held him on the cross. You could say it was love that held him there. Love for his father. Love for the, the children that he would purchase. And we who were formerly far off, Ephesians says, we who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And this love, this is not just a, a warm, fuzzy feeling. You see that pretty quick. You know, the the definition of love that we find ourselves in the culture we're in, just to, to feel good, to enjoy being with someone. You see, it's much more than that. This is the, the kind of affection that would lead you to action. Jesus left the throne of heaven. He humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So I just want to consider some aspects of Christ's love, some aspects we can look at of his love to, to consider for husbands. How do we love in the same way? To consider the, the initiating love of Christ that he saw their need when they were helpless, when they were dead in sin. He initiated. He went after them. He saw their weakness. They were without hope, without God in the world. And Christ gave himself. Not not a passive love, a a decisive love. We talk about leadership. This is leadership, decisive action, to see a need, to see someone in need and step into that need. Christ, seeing this need, this great need, our greatest need, in giving himself. So it's an initiating love. It's, it's a love that's not based on performance. While we were still sinners, Romans 5 says, while we were enemies, Christ died for the ungodly. When we were far off, we were rebels in our hearts. We were thankless. We were not asking, God, come save me. We were stiff-arming God. And Jesus died for sinners, for his enemies, he brought into his family. So not based on performance. And so often our our love is this way, is it not? So often dependent on what can you do for me? Or maybe just conditions on our love. I'll go this far and, and no further. If you reciprocate, then I'll serve you. If you appreciate me, then I'll serve. And here Jesus, based on nothing that we brought, we brought only sin, only shame, only rebellion, and he gave himself. This is biblical love. This is the kind of love we must have in a marriage, and not based on the quality of the, of the marriage that you have, not based on how appreciative your wife is, how thankful she is, but Christ-like love, doing what is, was right, regardless of response. Uh, this love is costly, You know the cost, the precious blood of Christ, the blood of the only Son of God without sin. Jesus does not just say words of affection. He demonstrates it with action. These are not mere words. Jesus paid the cost. This is an unwavering love. Uh, You could say an unchanging love. Think about Jesus in the garden. When he's saying, Father, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but your, your will be done. And he set his face like flint to Jerusalem. He is determined, regardless of the cost, regardless of the suffering. An unwavering love. Not, not hot and cold, but Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This kind of love. And it's a humble love. Christ who humbled himself, became obedient, took the, the form of a slave, so that he could die for his people. This is the kind of love that is pictured for us. This is the the model of sacrificial love, that our our love must be like this. This is a a self-giving love, initiating love, decisive love, costly love. A self-giving love. That's a high bar for the love in in a marriage. To say, you must love your wives that way, the way that Christ has loved you. And you know the battleground to this kind of love is self, is self-interest. What's in it for me? Right? And that, that battle against self, it will destroy our love. You know, we will not take initiative if we're saying, what's in it for me? We won't take initiative if, if we're just focused on our own needs, if we, we can't get outside of ourselves to see the needs around us. We won't uh, take costly sacrifices when we're selfish. We'll say it's not worth it. I'll only go this far and no further. 
We'll, we'll put conditions on our love when we think about self. I've done this eight times, 10 times, six months in a row. They've never appreciated. We have conditional love, uh, selfishness. We'll make our love change, right? We'll hold grudges. We'll take offense quickly. We'll become upset when someone doesn't appreciate, when they don't notice. So this is the, the battleground here for us, to take our eyes off of ourselves and put them back on Christ as we step into to love, as we step into marriage relationship, any relationship, to focus our eyes back on Christ. And for us to, in the home, to have his priorities for our home. And what I love, what comes next in verse 26 and 27, is Paul gives us, here is Christ's priority. Here is what he is after. This is what his love accomplished. He gave himself, and, and this is what he, he went after. This is what he prioritizes. Again, just to, to settle in our minds, in case there was any doubt, the great love that Christ has for his people, to, to really increase the weight for us. This is what love looks like, what sacrificial love looks like. Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. So to sanctify, to, to bring the church out of her moral impurity, to make her pure, to, to make her a worshiper, to make her able to stand before God, to make her clean. And it says here how, how he does this. He cleanses her, takes away her impurity by the, the washing of water with the word. I think this is the, the word proclaimed, the gospel proclamation, that you believe the gospel when you heard it, it was proclaimed to you. And then you are cleansed. You are sanctified. And you see in verse 27 where this is going, that he might present her, the church, to himself in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle, that she would be holy and blameless. So this is where it's going, glorification. He has set her apart for himself, and she will be glorified. This is Christ's great purpose for the church. This is what his love is after. We must sit longer and think about Christ and his great love. But, but this purpose helps us. You know, we, can't, we can't draw an equal sign to say the way, that, the way that I love my wife is the same as Christ. We are not the, the sanctifying influence in, our wives, in, the, in the wife of our life, husbands. We are not the Savior. We cannot make them holy. We cannot cleanse them. But we must have the same purpose as Christ if we know that Christ's purpose is the holiness of his people the purity of his people. That must be our purpose. Think about your wives this way. My, my purpose, my goal for her is Christ's goal. I want her to be pure. I want her to be holy. Christ has brought her, if she is a believer, from death to life. She's part of his family. I want to encourage her toward godliness because that's what God wants for her. He wants her sanctification. So I must want that as well. Just to, to think about moving your wife in a direction, to say, I want, I want to move her toward godliness. I want to encourage and exhort and step in and admonish when I have to because I want her to be godly. That's what sacrificial love looks like. And often the, the goal in a marriage is just peace, peace at all costs. I just don't want to have conflict. I just want to go home and have it be quiet and tranquil. And, and there are times when you, you, you must not have peace. You must not make peace with sin in a home. That you actually have to have hard conversations. You have to press toward godliness for the sake of Christ. And it might mean hard conversations. It might mean upending a superficial peace for a time for the sake of godliness. And our ultimate goal cannot be just, just a, a better marriage. I mean, if, if you sacrifice if you embrace these principles, you will have a better marriage. But our goal is not a better marriage. Our goal is not just, I want to go home and have a better home life. And there's no guarantee that if you sacrifice and lay down your life, that your marriage will go better. There's no guarantee, husbands, that that will happen. God doesn't promise you that. But, but what he does say, what is more important is that you will be pleasing in the eyes of Christ. This is an act of worship. You get to, to live in such a way Orient your marriage in such a way that you are pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we do it. This is what we go after. 
And I know some of you like, uh, like really practical help. I want some practical instruction. Help me implement this. Well, well, Paul actually gets really practical here in verse 28. I think gives us just a, a really practical picture in this, really this, this second characteristic. First, he talks about Christ's love as an example. And now he's going to talk about just the, the love, the care that you naturally have for yourself. Since you were uh, one day old, since you were born, your natural inclination to take care of yourself, to feed yourself. When I'm thirsty, I get a drink. When I'm hungry, I eat. When I feel pain, I step away from it. When I see danger, I run from it. So this kind of love, uh, first a self-giving love, and second now, an all-consuming love. Paul in verse 24 is, is instructed the wives to, to submit to their husbands in everything. Kind of all-consuming, all of life. Well, here, for the husband, in the same way, all of life. Love your wives as your own bodies. You are one flesh. So all of life, every part of life, you're thinking about her and her needs. Verse 28, he says, Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. They'll love her in the same way you naturally love yourself. And he says, he who loves his own wife loves himself. Because she's been united to you, because you are one flesh, treat her that way. You don't have to think about just caring for your natural needs. You don't have to think about yeah, when I'm, when I'm thirsty, I'm not going to go three days without drinking water. You just do that naturally. So Paul here is instructing the husbands to, to bring your wife into that, to care for her in that way, to care for her uh, all of her needs, all of the time, all consuming, all of life. You, know, you have fed and clothed and taken care of yourself for however many years before you got married. Now bring her into that. Take care of her in that same way that your natural instinct must now be to protect her, to provide for her. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you're thinking about coffee, or at least I'm thinking about coffee, to, to think about how do I bring my wife, uh, how do I bless my wife, how do I care for her needs in the way that I naturally care for my own needs? And in verse 29, he says, at the start of verse 29, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Uh, no one ever hated his flesh. Is, you could say it this way, that no one, no one enjoys physical pain. No one enjoys, you know, stepping on a Lego, paper cut. No one enjoys those things. He's saying no one ever hated his own body, but what, what, what's his natural instinct? His natural instinct is to nourish and cherish, to take care of, to nourish. This is to provide food for, sustenance, to cherish, to, to bring warmth to, to take care of needs. So again, he's saying that your natural instinct must be to care for her. And oftentimes, people use the, the framework of to protect and provide. I think that's helpful, a helpful framework to think about husbands. Your responsibility to protect and provide for your wife. That's an, another way to say it. That physically, you protect her. You, pr you provide for her physically. You provide food. You provide housing and shelter. You protect her from danger. But, but much more spiritually, you protect. You protect from, from spiritual danger. You provide for her spiritually. You make sure that, that she is involved in the life of the church. You are pouring truth into her life. You are, you are encouraging her with the truth, protecting her from, from things like bitterness, from sin in the home, from letting anger stew, letting quarrels go unchecked. So you are the, the watchman in the home. And it's not because the, the woman is, is less capable is less able. And this also doesn't mean you're, you're micromanaging all of her life. But this one flesh idea of, of her needs becoming your needs, that you are concerned about her, that your natural instinct, what does she need? How do I, how do I care for her? To, to love what she loves. Uh, I had a friend, I was thinking about a friend who inherited a dog when he got married. And he's uh, there probably a dozen years in, and he still has this dog. And in private, he doesn't really like the dog. But he has worked so hard to love this dog because it was her dog, because she loved the dog. I just love that picture. You know, that regardless of what you inherit, whether a dog or in-laws maybe, that, that you love, you know, you love what your wife loves. You love her family like your own family. 
that you have become one flesh. And just think about how that would impact your decisions. And you start thinking about decisions, is, what's the impact on her in this decision? How will this affect her? How will this affect her ability to do her work? How will she respond to this decision that I'm making? How can I care for her as I make this decision? What, what shepherding does she need? It's sad when you hear a wife express to a husband that, that you do a really good job of caring for other people's needs and being thoughtful. And I feel like I get the leftovers. I mean, how sad. And that, that's the, the natural tendency for husbands. I want to care about others and neglect this, this most important treasure. But, but our wives must be the, the primary recipient of our love, of our affection, of our thoughtfulness, of, of our care. In verse, the end of verse 29, Paul, again, is just weaving in and out. This is the love of Christ. You know, he gives us a love your wives. And now, again, Christ's love for the church. Into verse 29. This is how Christ loves the church. He nourishes. He cherishes. Because we are members of his body. He, he feeds us. He provides for us. I think about Psalm 23. The Lord is a, a shepherd who leads us to, to beside still waters, to green pastures. This is what Christ does. He leads. He provides. He cares. And the weight, I talk about the weight here of leadership, to feel that weight. But as you read this passage, you realize that all of that weight does not rest on, on your shoulders, men. That, that you have a Savior. You have one who, who provides for you, who has saved you, who has rescued you, and who now strengthens you. I love what Smed said uh, in the announcements, just that the, the hope that we have hope in the gospel, that we can actually go after these commands. As God gives us instruction, he puts forward a, a biblical picture of the home and a, of sacrificial leadership, that he also empowers us by his spirit to obey, that we can joyfully go after this, that we can have a, a, a love that's fueled by gospel grateful, gratefulness. So this isn't a, it isn't a burden, husbands. This is a, a joy, a delight. If you are in Christ, this is actually what God has for you. This is, this is God's best for you. God will empower you in this work. He will give you joy in this work. This isn't a drudgery. This isn't like, oh, I have to lose all of these things. I have to give up all this stuff I love. No, you, you give up the lesser things for a greater thing, for, for a, a greater work, and really a life of fulfillment and satisfaction because this is what pleases the Lord. And if we are not convinced yet at this point, Paul wants to ground us even more in Scripture. He wants to, to ground us in the, the authority of Scripture and what God has done. He goes all the way back in verse 31 to creation. He wants us to see again. This is how God has designed it. And it's so helpful, I think, in the, the climate we're in, the culture we're in, just to remind ourselves again and again in God's wisdom, he told us his plan in creation. This is God's design for marriage, for gender. God has told us, he has spoken. The creator gets to decide. We don't get to decide. He, he has spoken clearly. I want you to turn back to Genesis 2. We'll come to this, this passage here, verse 31 in Genesis 2, but I want to I look at the whole, uh, the whole context there. Genesis 2, starting in verse uh, 20. We looked at this a little bit last week, this uh, day six of creation, the creation of, of man and woman. The, as the Genesis 2 verse 4 really gives us a, a microscopic view of here's what, what went on on day six when God created man. So verse 20, the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to the every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and then he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in that place. And the Lord God fashioned into woman the rib which he had taken from the man. So God takes from the man. He uh, architects from the same matter as the man, the same DNA, the same organic structure. He's going to make him a suitable helper, a strengthener to help him in his work so that they together can go after God's work in the world. And then, verse 22, it says that God brought her to the man. 
And you have here what could be pictured as the, the first marriage ceremony. God as the, bringing the daughter down the aisle. God bringing Eve to the man, presenting her to the man. And here, verse 23, uh, Adam's marriage vows. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So here he is uh, agreeing with what God has said in Ephesians 5. This is what Paul is after, that they are one flesh. This is what, what Adam realizes. We are one flesh. You know, a promise before the Lord, an agreement with what God has done. We are one flesh. And then verse 24, this is the, the reference in Ephesians 5. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Here's the, the first family created, leaving their, their other families to, to picture future marriage. Obviously, Adam and Eve didn't have other families, but to picture uh, this is what marriage looks like. You're going to leave your family. You're going to create a new family, the, the first home here on display. At creation, God institutes the family. Day six of creation, the family. This is what God has in mind. This is how God has designed it before there was sin. So we must again see it as God sees it. The, the two becoming one flesh. You can turn back to Ephesians 5. In our culture, has, has taken marriage from a, this, this kind of one flesh covenant to a, to a contract, you know, a mutual contract between two parties. Marriage becomes a, an agreement. I'll agree to, to uphold some things, and you'll agree to uphold some things. And if one of us breaks this contract, then we'll walk away. We signed up together, there's a mutual agreement, and if we break it, we can bounce. And marriage is, is so much more than that, so much more than just a, a contract. So much more than just two parties involved. Uh, my wife and I were talking to a, a friend recently who was is, who is going through a, a foster to adopt process and just talking about in this process all of the, the court dates. And some of you in this room have, have gone through that process, have adopted through the foster care system. And she's talking about all the court dates of the, the severance of mom and dad and just months and months of court dates. But, but then she said, but there is the final court date set this all-important court date. And she says it's a little anticlimactic because it's just a 20-minute, you walk into this room, there's a judge, and, and they sit down, and, and there's not a lot of pizzazz, there's not a lot to it, but she said, but that moment means everything. Because at that moment, the judge decides and the state declares that this child is now part of your family, that they can't leave anymore that they are, they are yours. And I just think about that in terms of the, the marriage covenant. You know, what goes on when a, a man and a woman stand before the, we call the, the altar, when they come together in a marriage ceremony with, with people, all of their friends and family there, but also present God himself, you know, the judge in heaven, in the throne room of God, more than just a contract, but God himself overseeing this ceremony and saying the two have become one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man separate. That, that is what is in view here. A covenant, a binding covenant with God as witness, holding us accountable to this covenant, to treat her in this way, to remember this, to, to feel the weight of this. Just to think about the, the justice of God, that you have made a, a promise before the king of heaven to care for your wife. Every time we're self-indulgent, that we're lazy, that we're selfish, we're saying, God, I'm not concerned about this promise that I made. And we need to feel again the, the weight of responsibility, to feel uh, the weight of a passage like this, that in God's eyes, the two have become one flesh. This is how God sees it. This is the, the covenant promise you made before the king of heaven. So our, our feelings do not rule. Our dreams, our imaginations, our discouragements, our desires, you know, how you feel when you wake up in the morning, that does not rule. God's decree in heaven, that's what rules our marriage, that God has decreed it this way. This is what marriage is. You are one flesh in God's eyes. 
So we must uh, believe that passage. We must live like we believe that passage. We make, wake up in the morning believing this passage. As we're in a conflict, believing this passage. As we're tempted towards selfishness, believe again this passage, the two are one flesh. And what we want to do so quickly, uh, what men want to do, is, is make excuses. Find all of the, the reasons. Here's all the reasons why I, I can't do that today. Here's all the justifications. Let me, let me tell you the, the circumstances that went on. Let me help you understand why I couldn't fulfill that today. That's what our heart does. We want to justify sin. We want to make excuses. But biblical manhood, at its core, owns responsibility. It doesn't make excuses. Because the responsibility is given by God himself. And let me just, uh, just think through maybe a way that this, this plays out. And the way this can play out in my life is you, you get through a, a busy season of life, maybe a busy schedule season, and you, you kind of look at the, the chaos behind you. And, and you look at, man, the, everything feels out of control, and the kids feel out of sorts, and our schedule is just all over the place. And in those moments, the, the temptation for the, the husband, for me, for you, is to say, well, well, you don't understand the, the schedule. You don't understand what happened in this situation. You don't understand this commitment and this commitment as if somehow we are a slave to our schedule, as if somehow we didn't make the decisions. Obviously, there's going to be, from God's sovereign hand, there's going to be things we can't foresee. But to actually assess, you know, how did my decisions lead to this situation? Am I actually caring for my wife? Am I actually considering her needs? Did I consider her in this process as we got busy, as I'm looking back, was I sacrificially loving? Was I, was I thinking of her as my own flesh? I think again about just Jesus, his intentional leadership, his sacrificial leadership, that, that passive leadership, it's reactionary. It waits to make decisions. It waits till things get harder. It's not proactive. And so often, that's just a manifestation of a, of a love of self. You don't care for your own body that way. You aren't passive. You don't wait days to eat and drink, right? You take care of your own body. So lead your wife in that way. This kind of all-consuming, this active, thoughtful, proactive kind of love. And back to Ephesians 5, verse 32. It says, this mystery is great. And here's what he's talking about. He tells us, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. It's like Paul can't help himself. He just keeps going back to Christ as he talks about marriage, as he talks about this covenant commitment. Again and again, he says, but look to Christ. Take your eyes off your circumstances, off your excuses. Focus back on Jesus Christ. And there might be some in here that you hear a passage like this and you, and you feel only failure and you see mistakes and maybe sin. And just, just patterns of unfaithfulness in this care for your wife. And as you read this passage, hopefully you find hope, not in yourself, not in your abilities. But a, a Christian life is a, a life that confesses sin. As you see those things, that you would confess to the Lord. You would confess the, the sin to the Lord that led you there. That you would look again to Christ who gave himself. The, the forgiveness that we have the hope that we have in Christ, that you would resolve again today, this week, to, to live out this passage in faith, knowing that, that Christ gives you the strength through his spirit to obey. And I know the question uh, often arises for, uh, for those in, in just different marriage situations, what if my, my husband won't lead? Or what if my wife won't follow? What do I do? What do I do if, if he just won't lead? If he doesn't obey this passage? And I think it's helpful just to look at the, the final exhortation of Paul in, in context here of what, what he's done in this passage. Paul again in verse 33 stresses, nevertheless, each individual among you, each individual is to love his own wife even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So you see the the focus on, on you, you before the Lord. This is what you must go after. 
But also notice verse 33, just how Paul has laid out this argument. He started in verse 22 with the wives. Verse 25, the husbands. And what's packaged in there, all of the, the theology, all of the truth, he has taught us about Christ's sacrifice, about salvation. He has taught us about, about what God did at creation. I mean, there is so much truth that Paul is using to, to fuel our obedience here. So just think about uh, for a, a wife, to have a wife that's, that's unwilling to follow, unwilling to obey this command, or having a, a hard time. Maybe she's struggling. We talked about last week that the, the common struggle of a wife to submit is fear. Fear because she can't control her circumstances. Fear because, uh, as I heard one pastor say, she's thinking in her heart that God's will for my life is mediated through that man. And that's difficult. Right? She's fearful because she's having a hard time trusting the Lord, trusting his word, trusting his sovereignty, trusting his plan for her life. So what do you do in that situation is, is you don't start with Ephesians 5.22 as a badge and badge your wife with, you need to submit. What does she need if she's fearful, if she's struggling to obey the commands of Scripture? If she's struggling to trust God and his sovereignty? Well, she needs the truth. She needs to come face to face with God's word. She needs to come face to face with the character of God revealed in the Bible. She needs to, to believe that God is good and he does good. She needs to believe the, the promises of God. So that's where we need to start. Start with bringing truth into our homes, encouraging with truth that God is good, he is trustworthy, that his providence is good and only good. And the same for a, for a husband, a husband that won't lead. The answer for a wife is not to, to push him, not to try to manipulate him, not to coerce him, not to try to strong arm him, demand that he leads. And when a wife demands that her husband lead, she is actually leading. She is telling him, I'm going to tell you what to do and you must follow my leadership. Right, that's, not, that's not the solution. What does he need? He needs to, to feel the weight of this responsibility. And where does that come from? Where does that weight of responsibility come from? Well, it comes from interacting with the word of God, coming face to face with what God says, with who God is. It comes from fearing God as he's revealed himself in the word. So the one that's not embracing their leadership they need to, to hear from God again. They need to have a, a soul rot conviction that they must lead because God says they must lead. So this is what, as men in the church, what we must do for each other. We must encourage each other with God's truth. This is what you must do in your marriage. We must bring people back to the word of God again to feel this deep-rooted conviction in their soul that they must lead that they must embrace this responsibility. As I said at the start, the, the stakes are high here. The stakes are high for this kind of leadership because so goes the men in the church, so goes the church. You know, our ability to, to be salt and light in a lost and dying world is at stake in, in our ability to, to love in the home. I mean, this is where it starts, foundational. This is where the gospel takes root in a home. This is where Paul goes in Ephesians. Oh, this great gospel truth that you hear in the first three chapters of Ephesians. Now, what does it look like in the daily course of life, in your home, the, the marriage relationship, where you get to, to be a picture for a watching world? You get to be a picture for your kids. This is what Christ has done in my life. This is what the gospel has done in my life. I want you to, to witness the life change in the way that I love your mom because I love Christ. I want you to see that. I want my neighbors to see that. I want our friends to see that and our family to see that because I've been so gripped by the love of Christ that that spills out in the way that I love my wife most and in every other relationship in the home. So men, you have a, an opportunity this week to be a worshiper of Christ a worshiper, obviously we come in here on a Sunday and we worship, right? We sing, we, we read God's word, we worship, but, but you have an opportunity to worship through humble obedience this week as you do the, the small things, as you labor in the home, as you labor to love your wife sacrificially, as you labor to love your children, 
This is worship of Christ. This is pleasing to God. This is biblical leadership. This is biblical manhood. Sacrificial love played out in the home. So let me pray that we would be a church marked by this kind of love. God, when we come to a a passage like this, we feel our our need for you, this uh, seemingly impossible command to love our wives in the way that you have loved us. And yet we believe that you strengthen us and you empower us and that no command of yours is burdensome. So I pray that we would not be weighed down by these commands, Lord, but I pray that we would be encouraged, that you would put wind in our sails to go after obedience, that you would bless the marriages in this room. And you would bless them not for our own sakes, but for your sake, Jesus, that your name would be exalted in houses, in neighborhoods, that when people walk into this room, into this church, what they see are are loving families that have been transformed by the gospel. And they experience the love of Christ and they hear the gospel message and they see it lived out in the way that we love each other. So Jesus, we pray that you would uh, accomplish that work even this week in our hearts and our lives. Amen.